Brent Delta, 9 p.m., Saturday, September 22nd, 1979. For millions of years, the energy of numerous minute life forms lay in rocks under the sea, trapped by tremendous pressures. Now, modern technology has brought this ancient black power to the surface, and the northern night sky glows as the energy is released. Brent Delta and its satellite, the Nortral, are but two of 40 platforms between the Shetlands and Norway. The Murchison, the Claymore, Ninian Central, the Cormorant, the Vilkat, Stadfjord, all are tapping ancient reservoirs of fossil power. To achieve that, each has an insatiable need for supplies. Brent Delta demands 600 tons a week. A new compressor, 10,000 pump gaskets, 288 pairs of rigorous gloves, 130 crates of fresh fruit and vegetables, three miles of drill pipe. The supplies are used by these men to reach down through the rock beneath them. These men and their machines have made us self-sufficient in oil for the first time ever. Everything done on Brent Delta, everything brought onto it, every activity of every one of the 230 men who work here is directed towards one end alone to produce three quarters of a million pounds worth of oil every day. At 7 a.m. the day shift begin their long 12-hour stint on a platform which is potentially a very dangerous place. Surprisingly, accidents are rare. It is over four months since there was a serious injury on deck or drill floor. Shell continually press the men to regard safety as part and parcel of the job. Yet this obsession with safety is not simply motivated by the employer's concern for life and limb, but their concern for oil and profits. A broken hand or leg or a severe burn this is assessed in hours of lost work, and so lost oil and lost profits. Just one hour's lost production means 30,000 pounds lost income. Even the numerous safety procedures are there to ensure that the platform gets more oil out. Ten p.m. Sunday evening. Half the men are asleep on Delta and next door on the Nortral. But even in sleep, they still subconsciously experience the ceaseless sounds, vibrations and smells that are the signs of the platform's activity and well-being. These continue, unchanging, reassuring. But deep within the humming machinery, the crucial seals and switches, the miles of pipes and valves under immense pressure, there is always a chance that somewhere, something will fail. Red alert. All personnel report immediately to their boat muster points. The rule applies to all on board. 
teammate. Yep. Ready, lad. Come on. All right. Those who disobey are punished severely. They are sent back to Scotland and lose their jobs. This is an alert required by British law. Every eight weeks, there must be a full-scale lifeboat drill. It's a reminder to all of their isolation by the sea. In the radio room, George Lohman, in the center, is the offshore installation manager. Like the master of a ship, the manager is responsible to Her Majesty's government for the men's safety and welfare. Or to shell for a few hundred million pounds worth of hardware. Now for seeing that every single man is accounted for. Assembly for him. Uh, The platform's function has not been forgotten. Men stay on duty in the control room to keep oil flowing. They also keep the turbine generators running. Brent Delta relies on them for all its electricity. Yes, yeah, seven we are present now, please. Three present. Three over. Three present at one point. Three, thank you. You got three there at last count. He, he gave it up by three, so you've got the two plus the one. So you've got two for not all. The cancel. By 10.30, all are at muster stations. George Lohman activates the blue alert. Abandoned platform. flows when a well's drilled. The crew have nearly finished their eighth well. That leaves 40 more to drill, taking about 10 more years. Working at this speed for 12 hours at a time is potentially dangerous. Never think about it out here. It's when I go home. I think most of us seem to think about it when we go home, think about the silly things we do out here and the, the chances you do take. You get a lot of turns off being like that, but John, I've got to do that to make you stay alert and pay attention, you know, because it's too dangerous to start forgetting about it and dreaming. If you're a hazard to yourself or anybody else in the drill floor, you won't belong here. Hope belong is putting you back down. You just have to concentrate all the time. 
when you're new to what's going around you. If your concentration slips, you're liable to get hurt. And uh, if you do get hit by anything, it's not going to be just a, a gentle blow. It's really going to be something that's going to hit you hard. Fighting, you see, your, your tongues have a, the tail, which is the, the heavy part, see? You just throw it round and it grips the pipe itself. You just make sure you have to hold it there so it doesn't unlatch itself or anything. Otherwise the tongue will spin around and hit you and probably kill you. a.m. Monday morning. There's a pause in drilling while the day shift roughnecks work directly under the drill floor. Roughnecks earn around £7,000 a year, about the same as a coalface worker. Most men on the platform earn considerably more. They're working on the blowout preventer. The drill pipe runs through it and powerful hydraulic rams stop disastrous surges of oil and gas to the surface by enclosing and clamping or even shearing the pipe. This morning, the seals are being changed to fit a smaller pipe than the one pulled up last night. The men work for Westburn Drilling. If they don't get results, Shell won't contract Westburn next time. The contract system is used throughout the North Sea, even though it means paying around £20,000 in salary for an extra man on board. Mate. Above them on the drill floor is that extra man, Tom Adams, the Shell tool pusher. Keep an eye on your hole as well, because it'll either be you or Lazarus up on the floor, yeah? yeah. Just keep an eye on your holes while they're running it. Tom enforces the contract. He has to see that Westburn finish the present well as fast as possible, get four more wells drilled within the next year, and eventually double today's 70,000 barrel output. Mr. Shields, you take this up. You want to take it down? Tom's on call 24 hours a day. You could be up 36, 48 hours on the trot, and you're like a wet rag at the end of it. You stay on. Some people have got fantastic uh, means of carrying on. and uh, But then again, if you get a five, six hour sleep after it, you're, you're back into it again. It's only for seven days or 14. As far as I'm concerned, it's seven. That's enough. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, that's about it. Yeah, I quite enjoy it. In fact, I must say, I must admit straight off, uh, sometimes I really enjoy it. My pleasure, Tom Adams sees that Westburn drills the holes, then fits 900 tons of steel pipe accurately into each one, not forgetting sealing cement, tie-back packers, anchor seals and subsea safety valves. What you want to do is you want to get the oil from the formation out to be used. You want to get it into the pipeline to town. Um, you, your last, the last job you want to do is perforate because as soon as you perforate in a hydrocarbon formation, that means that you've opened a well. You're liable to anything nature can throw at you. Don't you? Okay, obviously we take precautions in this respect that uh, you've got uh, equipment on surface that will stop this. But nonetheless, you you want to cover yourself 100% most of the time. In other words, that's 99.99 and as many as you like to add on the end. There's always that small fraction that something will go wrong. I think has happened to Ecofisk or one of the, some of the other ones in Mexico at the moment. It is precisely because of such risks that oil is seldom seen on an oil platform. A few sampling points are out on deck, so gas coming up with the oil and escaping noisily as the pressure's released is blown safely away. At present, most of this enormous quantity of gas is wasted in Delta's flare. Tony Emsley checks the oil's quality and its strange light brown colour. Why does it look so funny? Because there's a lot of water in it. And that oil will gradually settle out and you'll get a layer of water at the bottom and the oil will be at the top, nice and black. And uh, as we lift up, the, the oil comes up out of the ground, the uh, water comes up with it and it uh, just stays like this until it separates. To get the first drop of this Brent oil cost a thousand million pounds, the price of Concord's development. But the North Sea investment is no white elephant. In September, despite income wasted by flaring gas, 
Delta was making a sizable operating profit. Other companies like BP are already making huge profits. Shell and their partner Esso hope to at least break even in the North Sea in 1982. The wells that are the source of all their income are covered by manholes, like these on Delta's deck. There are 48 possible wells, but only eight are drilled. So beneath eight of these, long pipes descend to the oil reservoir. The top of each one is capped by a complex valve, the Christmas tree. This is where the oil comes out of the ground and where the flow is controlled and measured. Every second, nine pounds worth of oil runs through the meter. Below decks is machinery which separates the oil from the gas and from any water. To sell the oil, it must be got ashore. The Brent Delta is 110 miles from the Shetland Isles, and the pipeline is not yet finished. The platform can store underwater up to a million barrels in concrete tanks, but it's too dangerous to pump oil from here directly into a tanker. So they've laid a pipe a few miles across the sea floor to a floating buoy, which can be linked up safely to a tanker. Delta is one of three Brent platforms pumping oil through this buoy. Alpha and Bravo increase the output to about two and a half million pounds a day. Shell and Esso expect the Brent field to be the richest in the North Sea. It covers about 20 square miles. To tap Brent's riches, they could only afford to build four production platforms. So the wells from each one must somehow cover several square miles of oil reservoir. On a platform of the likes of uh, the Delta, we have 24 wells on each leg, each, west, each east leg and the west leg. So, you, obviously, if you have them all vertical, it wouldn't be very practical. You place a platform in the middle of, or in a section of the field which you want to drain. So, you, obviously, you want to drain the most you can. You've got to deviate these wells to the extremities of a zone that you're going to pull oil from. So, in actual fact, you're going, you're building up angle to about 60, 70 degrees in some cases, which is quite a steep angle. The steep angle of each well has to be plotted accurately at all points from surface to oil field. That's to be done this morning on well D17. Roger Costick is a gyro compass specialist. He calibrates the gyro using a conventional compass which he lines up in the living quarters. Since Delta is anchored to the bottom, she is static and this point never moves. The calibration is transferred to the gyro itself. Ten a.m. The compass reading will now be recorded every twenty seconds as it descends. They want to know the direction of the well at every point from surface to the bottom. That's fifteen thousand feet, about three miles. Since the hole's at an angle, the compass should end up two and a half miles northwest of the platform and one and a half miles down. They must know the well's direction to plan future wells and to ensure that they cover the oil reservoir evenly. Under here is the blowout preventer. This is the same hole now washed and cleaned that the drill crew were working on last night. The hole goes down through one of Delta's legs into the sea floor then through thousands of feet of shale and sand. The well twists and turns down past the others towards the oil and gas bearing sands. But 12,000 feet down, before it reaches the oil, the gyro compass sticks. Within minutes, Tom Adams contacts their neighbor, the Brent Bravo, who've had a similar problem. Bravo, Delta is on his way, one moment. call the radio. Right, Tom. The Bravo have modified their compass with rings to keep it centered in the hole and so slip past the obstruction. Okay, yeah, I think we'll be at the end of the gauge ring. We just have a rubber stopper on the top and uh, we'll put four centralizers on. But uh, we can also do with some more weight. Uh, is your slumber engineer there? Barry Nicholson, Oceanic. Nicholson, Oceanic, three. Yeah, please, just uh, I want to ask him a few questions. Meanwhile, the Delta Zone compass is pulled up. It got stuck on cement left on the sides of steel tube lining the hole. The 
cement was put down to seal any gaps in or around the lining. Bernie Simpson, the petroleum engineer, worries most if they don't complete this survey, or log as they call it. He needs a complete mental picture of every aspect of the well. This is only one of several tools they've winched up and down. Others have already told them the type and thickness of the rocks, the amount of oil, even the quality of the seals in the whole lining. They'll now have to check this equipment for damage and decide what to do. This is a guide that we're doing on about the seam of the rape kit, it's a modification they've done. So we'll get, it's slumbers your hand over there and, and the Bravos actually got it. Tom's still uncertain. Ultimately, it's only by experience that he knows what the lumps of cement look like 12,000 feet beneath it. They see what the modification was. It may just have been take the rubber off and put a, a spear or something on. They drive it through and uh, it'll go. But if not, this is, we'll just carry on, we'll scrape it. Another run with the tool, trying to aim it like an arrow through the gap, would cost a few thousand pounds. But the alternative, clearing the hole, would be ten times that. So where's, where's uh, Bernie? Do you know is he upstairs? The decision will be taken by the bosses at the shell base in Aberdeen. Yeah, just going through now, Bernie. Hello, Joe, Bernie. Shell base, Brindel, though. Shell base, Brindel, though. Yeah, good morning, Jim. Uh, we just uh, checked the tool when it came out the hole again. And uh, it seems to be hanging up on cement or something. The centralizers on the tool were a bit uh, big, actually, a bit stiff. So that uh, didn't help too much either. Huh? You might realize what this will do to our log, huh? Yeah, OK. Now, uh, once we've done this, we'll uh, circulate to water, and then we'll uh, run this tie back back after, huh? OK, Jim. Well, if you could just send me a telex on that. Yeah. Aberdeen instructs them to delay this logging run until they've cleared the hole with a scraper. The drilling company Roughnecks now have to assemble the scraper, but they're a new crew and have never done it before. We'll take the scraper up and screw the scraper into there. Then that one screws on there, and that one screws in there, and it goes on there. Okay? So stand that up on the table and screw it on here. Just stand it on the table. Here, Mike. Let this one down a little bit. Pick that one up. The scraper will slip down the first 12,000 feet. Beyond, the lining of the hole is narrower, and the ridges on the scraper will fit snugly inside it, scraping off any surplus cement as they descend. Jimmy, all I can see is your back. Mike, you'll have to change your tongs around. How long was it? Les Morris, the driller, must know to an inch how long the assembly is, so that he'll be able to tell when it's nearing the cement obstruction. We're just making sure we got the numbers, Tom. Now that's it there, 130. This time they go down through the rocks, past the light orange gas layer, past a well with Delta's oil gas mixture flowing up it, and down not to a layer of oil, but to a layer of water. This will be used to increase pressure underground and so force more oil out more quickly. You can't always rely on natural pressure to drive the oil out of the well. 
uh, and now, of course, it's considered the price of oil, the expense of drilling for it, and everything else being considered. Secondary uh, means have got to be devised, and uh, at the moment, I think worldwide, there's a lot of uh, ideas being bandied about. But uh, offshore in uh, the North Sea, the, ba the basic ones are gas injection, which is the gas taken separated from the oil prior to going along the pipeline to the, the beach. Uh, it's taken and put through uh, compressors to be re-injected into the formation above the oil zone so it can drive more oil out from the formation. Another method is uh, water injection. Uh, wells are drilled into the water zone so the water uh, is taken, puri or not purified, but prepared for re-injection into the formation also to drive oil out. The well the scraper is in at the moment will eventually be pumped full of such clear water, shown in light blue, so increasing pressure underground and forcing more oil up. But it won't prevent gas being flared. Until last week, they were working in another type of well, which would prevent gas flaring and waste. Gas separated from the oil can in theory be forced back down a well, increasing the pressure of gas in the light orange gas cap, and so not only forcing more oil up, but also storing gas for the future. On this September day, Delta is wasting 120 million cubic feet of gas, enough to run gas cookers for a city of 5 million people. So why have they stopped work on the gas injection wells? This is all decided in the... Uh... London Aberdeen as to what is uh, what is a priority. I mean, uh, the political, the business sense is nothing for us, in fact. Shall we say we're the frontline troops and just do as we're told? London and Aberdeen don't yet know how the frontline could get the gas wells functioning without dangerous leaks. So rather than waste money on an idle drilling crew, they're working in the water well, which will increase oil production and so profits. It's now late Monday afternoon. The scraper reached the bottom with no problems, and they're pulling it up again in 90-foot lengths. That's 11 out, 990 feet, just over 14,000 feet still down there. So we just, we just do we be Meanwhile, Tom and the petroleum engineers are discussing the next stage, completing the well so water could be pumped down it. <coughs> so by the weekend, well, Friday, Friday night, you're talking Friday night, Saturday, you're going to have to start thinking about brain again. Seven thirty PM, the same crew are at work. Eleven thousand five hundred feet have been pooled. That's a hundred and twenty eight lengths of pipe. By eight thirty on Monday evening, the scraper has already surfaced, leaving only the drill bit in the hole. It's taken eight hours to get this out, but now at least until the next shift, the crew can take what relaxation Delta offers. Tails, oh, lads. Good on you, Blue. Right. First ones, lads. You want to uh, double gross. During their week on Delta, this is the closest anyone gets to a dram. There's no alcohol and no women. Some diehards feel they'd cause fights out here. Good heavens, man. 
Was he riding that bed, Tom? I said make it neat, eh? So, there are 20 minutes left in the charity shield. It's only going to one foot now. Johnson. No, it's it. Oh, he's brilliant. He's brilliant, though, isn't he? Wine and women would sweeten offshore life, but wouldn't affect the main restriction to the men's freedom. They cannot escape here or on deck from the atmosphere and sights of work. Shell have tried. These quarters are even mounted on rubber pads to reduce noise and vibration. But the platform's function ruthlessly imposes on every aspect of life here. Normally, there's a good choice of hot food at dinner time, but tonight it's a cold buffet. Even that served to ensure that the oil flows smoothly. They couldn't cook today as the galley is closed for inspection. It is the greatest fire risk on board. One day each week it must be rigorously checked for fire hazards. Though the driller is the hub round which oil production turns, most of these men have other skills. Engineers, pipe fitters, electricians, caterers, welders, administrators, radio operators. Throughout the Brent field, a total of three and a half thousand men are needed to keep oil flowing and the flow increasing. Twice every 24 hours, 1,700 go on shift and 1,700 come off. At sunrise and sunset, stark figures begin to move from Delta to their beds on Ortrol. Throughout the Brent field, there's a shortage of accommodation, except on Ortrol. So others prepare to commute to their beds up to 10 miles across the darkening sea. From Bravo and the Dunlin, from the Alpha and the Cormorant, from the Spar and the Treasure Finder.
9.15 a.m. Tuesday morning. This is no bedtime commuter flight. It's an intercity. For Shell, it's one of the most important events in the North Sea, actually getting men out 300 miles from Aberdeen. Today, 760 men will be shifted to and fro like this. Tomorrow, just as many. There are far more aircraft movements in the Brent Field than at London's Gatwick Airport. The passengers are fresh from six days off. They've come onto a platform that's had only minor problems. A few areas flooded by the fire deluge system, a man with a damaged hand who was flown home, a few complaints about the heat from the flare on deck. Drilling is behind schedule, but oil is flowing. Among the passengers is Ray Smith. He used to be a shell tanker captain traveling the world. Now he's responsible for a structure guaranteed stable until June the 29th, 2001. Ray Smith now takes over safety, welfare and platform diplomacy from George Lohman. In the log is everything from painting the helideck to fire alarms and accidents. So they had a gas leak into one of these cups on the test sepulchre and we think that he touched the cup when the supervisor went up the control room and it exploded. He's very lucky. Only cut his hand. He got a couple of stitches and then he had to go ashore. Mm -hmm. So this this has got rather serious implications. It's been looked at. The KDG rep has been out and he's checked all uh, the switches. There's about 26 of them down there on the trains. He's checked them all out. No faults. But that one definitely had a fault on it. But in general, Ray Smith's sticking over a smoothly running platform. This morning, a 30-knot southwesterly wind is blowing the flare straight across the deck. The radiant heat is like the tropical sun. The platform swelters beneath it. Water turns to steam. Exposed skin will soon burn. And even with protective clothing, the men work for an hour and then take a break inside. For Delta, none of this is unusual. It's early on a fine day in late September. If anything, the platform's a little complacent. They've produced so much oil that the storage facilities are almost full. However, there's bad weather on the way, so there may be no tankers for some time. As it turns out, overproduction is not to be the problem. All hot work to cease immediately. All hot work to cease immediately. Attention, please. Attention. Peter Gale, Peter Gale, production supervisor, watching in the control room immediately. Peter Gale to the control room immediately, please. Attention, please. Attention, Peter Gale, production supervisor, watching in the control room immediately. Any fault in the oil production system is Peter Gale's responsibility. A gas leak's been discovered on the first stage gas oil separator. Delta to Shell Expo Aberdeen, 0938 September 27th. Platform shut down from 0905 hours to carry out replacement of four inch blowdown valve. There's only one way to repair the leaking valve, and that means Shell Esso will lose a third of a million pounds income. Through the morning, no oil or gas flows. To those who know her, Delta looks strange. The pipes and valves are taken apart and repairs begun. At 12.40, a meeting's called to review progress. Yes. I, I think, uh, Peter Gale, as head of production, has the problem. Next to him is the head of transport and catering, then maintenance and engineering. Across the table sit tool pusher Tom Adams, the safety officer and the construction boss. Ray Smith is in the chair. Yeah, well, we don't want to go back up there and start picking it off again before the helicopter's one. Oh, well, I mean, that's not good news for flying. <laughs> we hope to be started up somewhere between two and three the, this afternoon. That's the, uh, the estimate at the moment, and I think we'll pretty well stick to it. How, how does that, how does that uh, cross over with Les and uh, yeah, Ron well, here? Yeah, no, this 9.036 will definitely be finished for two o'clock. Yeah. 
They've got the body put the there now. They'll definitely be finished with two o'clock. Okay. Now the uh, have we got the the gun across? Yes, there are the guns already, and uh, it's put the carriages in. So there's no problem. So. Okay. And uh, Alistair, would you uh, this this afternoon you get hold of the PE? I'll sure. give you the keys, and we'll get the cartridges out of the explosive I've, stove. I've got cartridges over. So unless we need... How many have you got? There's uh, about eight cartridges. Oh, okay over. then. Okay, well we know it's... I've got you living down there. Yeah. 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 Well we know that's the standard. Yeah. Yeah. Well we won't do anything until he... Until he, 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 he gets to number nine. Number nine. nine. <laughs> we'll draw the, the twelve. Okay. <clears throat> you going to do it yourself or is somebody delegated? No, I'll do it. So, you can go. so Peter Gale takes on another responsibility with some physical risks. But first, both oil and gas separation systems, or trains, must be safe and ready for use again. So that's open right through to train one separator. It's open right through, yeah. Train one gas outlets open the first stage. Uh, go up that. Train and one it, gas outlet, yeah. you open that one up. The oil, out, the oil outlet. Yeah. Oil outlet is open, yeah. Yeah, and the blowdown valves are all closed. The locked off. blowdown valves closed. It's, it's not locked. It's not locked. Really it's not locked. What about the closed drains? That's all closed, closed boxed up, and the drain on. The oil and gas separation trains are ready, but there are still delays. 4 p.m. Despite the activity, the platform still shut down. The welding repair is taking longer than expected. While there's still time and no risk of oil or gas leaks, the issue of fire permits to allow three more desperately needed welding jobs to continue. Once gas flows, the fire risk will be too great. Hello, Doug, it's Peter speaking. Um, well, we're, we're just about all set up now, so we'll uh, definitely be starting up again between quarter two and five o'clock, OK? Well, yes, we'll have to have a, a, a purge through on it as soon as we get a couple of wells open up and a good purge. Probably by half past. OK, then. Jerry on. Calling the fire permits now? Fine. Yeah. Attention, attention. Could all fire permits be returned to the control room prior to production start-up? All fire permits returned to the control room. Dave Finley, Dave Finley, can you open up the choke on well 25? Open the choke, well 25. As the choke on well 25 is opened, oil and gas surge up three miles of subterranean pipe and begin to flow into the mass of tanks, separators and valves round the platform and in the legs. Down inside the legs has been concern about poisonous gas leaks and the opportunity is taken to check that the levels are safe. Yeah, you get a lot of gas through. Yeah, initially. Has Ian Neil got a radio with him? Yeah, Ian Neil's done there, yeah. He's done three too. Uh, Ian Neil, Ian Neil, come in. D18 is now open. Right here, yeah, there's uh, Peter here now. D18 now. Hello, Dave. Okay, well, just in case it's uh, going to be train one to keep an eye on that then. Uh, just uh, take it open to 15% uh, uh, to start with, and let's settle it down first of all. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, in. Ian, we've only got 15 bar pressure on the first stage separator. Uh, we would uh, assume it would be a lot higher than that at this stage. Could you check that out, please? BCV on that, Robin. No, it's, it's rising now, the first stage there. We're just picking up. Slowly, very slowly, the oil flows. The first barrels leave Delta after eight and a half hours of shutdown. A potentially explosive cloud of gas escapes from the flare tip. The automatic flare ignition system's not working. It's a fault Peter Gale foresaw, and he's already volunteered to light the flare himself. The fire risk is so great that drilling has stopped and all helicopter flights are suspended.
Yeah. Okay. To these men, the flare is a symbol of achievement, of success, of the flow of oil that is the sole reason for spending half their lives isolated in the sub-Arctic sea. Oh yeah, that was first class. To Shell and Esso, it's a symbol of much welcomed and, they hope, increasing income. But to the British government, the flare also symbolizes the waste of resources. In November, they limited gas flaring in the Brent field to a mere 170 million cubic feet a day, half its September level. That half dealt us oil output until the gas reinjection wells are finished. Yet we still produce nearly as much oil as we use. If we are glad to be producing oil, it is the men out here we have to thank. It's their muscle, knowledge and tenacity which gets the stuff out week on and week off. Sometimes you might just be starting into a very interesting part. You say, I wonder if I could stay another week. But it doesn't last for long, roughly about a hundredth of a second. <laughs> BBC One Scotland. Can't account now investigates the question of safety in the North Sea. <laughs> 